So I've, uh, I've said before at uh, earlier Embedded Vision Alliance meetings, I think this, uh, these concerns around privacy and embedded vision are, are a huge risk for the industry. It's, it seems inevitable things are going to go wrong, right? People are going to uh, capture images w and use them in ways they're not supposed to be using them or people don't like them using, whether it's a deliberate by the product developers or someone misappropriating, hacking a product. And I think the, uh, the, the, the risk is that uh, we could have a huge backlash against the use of technology uh, this kind of technology, right? And if there starts to be a, a lot of pushback against putting cameras everywhere, that could be an enormous setback for, uh, for embedded vision. We already see this uh, today with things like Google Glass, where people are, you know, getting assaulted, right, in bars because they're wearing uh, Google Glass with a camera built in, and somebody thinks they're being, you know, recorded, they don't want to be recorded, and, well, they've had a few drinks, and it goes downhill from there. Um, I think as an industry, it, it's incumbent upon us to think this through a bit, be a bit proactive, try and figure out how to uh, try to preempt and reduce some of this risk so that it doesn't wind up you know, blowing back in our faces and setting back all this great stuff we know we can do with the technology that actually is going to help people and not harm them uh, because you know, of, of some mistake that someone makes, some misperceptions that, uh, that wind up you know, uh, uh, propagating. So that's why I was very excited to have Brian here. Brian is an attorney who has a particular interest in social media and mobile technologies and augmented reality and other uh, vision-related technologies. He's also on the board of augmentedreality.org, which is the organization that runs the Augmented World Expo Conference, which we have partnered with and are co-locating our Embedded Vision Summit event with uh, in late May in Santa Clara. So uh, with no further ado, Brian, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Jeff, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I really am excited about what this group is doing and really what it has the potential to become. Now, um, the summary I'm going to give is a high-level summary of privacy law, uh, what privacy is about, particularly in the United States, because that's the jurisdiction we're in, the jurisdiction I practice in, but a lot of the um, concepts are going to be portable in, in, in different jurisdictions as well. Uh, and I'm expecting that uh, none of you will be completely surprised by everything that I say. I, I think that, that all of you are familiar with at least some of these concepts that I'm going to discuss. And uh, my, my hope, though, is that uh, none of you are familiar with all of them as well, that we'll, we'll shed uh, light in different areas uh, for, for each of you. And also, I understand that, that none of your companies are necessarily in, in the same position to affect change in these areas or have the same exposure to different privacy issues um, that, that we're going to discuss. But in, um, in the course of the conversation, I'm hoping that, as Jeff said, we can get all of us on the same page, be working from the same background, have the same general ideas of what pro these privacy considerations are, and then internalize that into uh, the experiences of your own company and the situations that you're in. So first, of course, uh, like any good uh, conversation about the law, we need to define our terms, and so we need to figure out what is privacy, what, what is this concept uh, all about. And whenever we discuss privacy, particularly in the United States, um, we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. And, and that elephant in the room is something we call the First Amendment. Now, there are uh, five words in this uh, provision adopted more than 200 years ago that have set us on the course that we're on now, and that is uh, the uh, abridging the freedom of speech. Government in the United States, not allowed to do that, not allowed to abridge or limit your freedom of speech. And so for the 200-some-odd years since that provision has been adopted, we've been struggling to figure out, the courts have, just what that freedom of speech is and, and how is it that we're not allowed to abridge it. Um, there, there has been, in the history of the United States, one justice of the Supreme Court that interpreted this phrase literally. He said, no law means no law. And so anything that prevents uh, the, for, something from being expressed in any format whatsoever is going to be unconstitutional. Everybody else, every other court has realized, look, this is one very important right. It exists in a hierarchy of other competing rights, and so we need to balance those against each other. We need to figure out when this freedom of speech ends, what the boundaries of that freedom of speech are, and where 
the ability to abridge or regulate speech begins. So that's, that's where we come into the idea of privacy. Privacy exists everywhere around the, the penumbra of that, of that zone of, of free speech. Because uh, as interpreted, free speech means not only the, the ability to say something, but the, to convey information as is, is, is well to support your argument. This is why a news reporter, for example, has a right not only to go and write down a story and report about an incident, but also to take pictures of that incident, to convey uh, imagery or video of, of what happened in this newsworthy incident. We, this provision was adopted ultimately to serve a particular purpose, which is to fuel the conversation, public conversation about matters of public importance. This concept of free speech uh, in the American experiment is fundamental to this idea of participatory government. We can't participate uh, in, a, in a democracy effectively if we don't know what's going on around us. So that's the motivation behind this provision, behind it being adopted, that we need, we all of us have the right to express to each other our views on these issues of common importance. Understanding that informs what the, how the courts interpret this idea of freedom of speech and interpret what is uh, something of public importance and what's not. And so ultimately, the things that, uh, that the law will shield in one respect or another as private are going to be those things that the court has decided are not matters of public importance or that uh, certain other competing interests justify keeping that out of the public eye. So when we think about uh, privacy, the, the most common and, and reflexive idea of privacy is uh, something that we can keep to ourselves, that we can keep out of the public eye. And, and so we have uh, what's called uh, the, the common law of, of invasion of privacy. Common law being a, a, a law that is not adopted by any legislature. It doesn't exist in any, any code, any statute. It is a principle adopted by judges uh, in a particular factual circumstance, a principle that has been elaborated in different facts, and we can look at, at these uh, different applications, different precedents to see uh, what, what right is, is being adopted and what the boundaries of that are. But we only, we only get those boundaries through the, um, the case law that's been interpreted in the past rather than any one written down statute of law. So it, the, the law of invasion of privacy as exists, the common law of privacy, uh, basically boils down to three different bullet points. And we call those things uh, intrusion into seclusion, disclosure of private facts, and false light. And those capture what we really think of reflexively as privacy. So intrusion into seclusion means exactly what it sounds like, something that is in, in a private sphere in our rooms, our homes, our bedrooms, our bathrooms, and in that intruding into that, that zone of seclusion, that zone of, of private area that, that, that where nothing of public concern is going on, um, that's, that's uh, an actionable tort. That's, that's something that you can bring a common law action of invasion of privacy for. Example in the embedded vision context. You, you probably have read the headlines back only a couple years ago where uh, a school system got in trouble for loaning out laptops to students and then uh, running software on it that, that kept the webcam running. So we have, we, we have a, a principal that now in a school system that gets all of this information, the live video beamed from students' webcams, whether they're, they're at home or whatever they're doing. Um, and that's obviously an intrusion into a place where, where the, the student and their family have a legal right to protect their seclusion. We, we, we see the same thing in, uh, in, in secret cameras installed in bedrooms and tanning salons, things we, we see on a regular basis on the news, upskirt videos, things, things that intrude into places that we, we uh, viscerally and legally consider to be private areas. So disclosure of private facts, very similar, except we're dealing with information now instead of uh, a vision, uh, but all vision can certainly inform the gathering of that, those private facts. Here we're often concerned about matters of, of, of personal health, uh, sexual behavior, uh, sexual histories, things of that nature. We consider those to be private facts that aren't justifiably uh, made public. They are not matters of public concern in the eyes of the law. And then false light is something uh, very akin to defamation of the law of libel and slander. Uh, libel and slander uh, include, involve the communication of facts that are objectively false, here in the tort of, of false light, we are communicating things that are not in and of themselves false, but portrayed in a context to give a false impression. 
So a, a, a picture, a video of someone in, in, uh, in a certain, a, from a certain angle cropped to communicate a certain message or to convey something that's not actually true. That's, some, that's an example of how vision technology falls into the, uh, the tort of false light. Very similar concept, although this one is derived from actual statutes, both on the federal and the state level, and that's the idea of eavesdropping. And that is generally thought of, although the particulars vary from state to state or, or federal court, to, depending on, on the jurisdiction and the source of the law being applied. Uh, it's also known as wiretapping, same, same principle on the federal level. And this is the idea of, of making a recording of someone else's conversation without their knowledge or consent. And you can see where, where mechanical vision plays into this role. Now, now this, this still comes from an eavesdropping case that I had uh, the opportunity to litigate. This case uh, lasted in the courts for 10 years. 10 years this, this piece of litigation went on. And it all stemmed from this particular conversation you see depicted here in which uh, a, a rap uh, concert was coming through to the city of Detroit and the cops got wind of a particular video that was going to play during the concert that they didn't care for. And so they showed up at, after five o'clock behind the scenes and demanded that the video be removed from the concert or else everyone there would be prosecuted for violating obscenity laws. Obviously the tour promoters took umbrage to that and there were a several hour conversation back and forth between the promoters and the police about whether or not this was going to happen. Finally the the, the Promoters caved at the last minute, pulled the video, and, um, and you know, litigation ensued. Uh, a year later, the behind-the-scenes DVD comes out, and it contains a bonus track, which contains this footage right here. It's called Detroit Controversy. And it, it is 11 minutes of a, a documentary of, of what happened here. Now, the police officers that you see on the screen there and, and the other city officials that were involved in, in the altercation, they sued on a variety of, of claims, some of which aren't relevant here, but the, the one that, that had legs uh, ultimately was an eavesdropping claim. They claimed that whoever it is running these cameras uh, were recording a conversation that was private, that they had an expectation of privacy in, and, and that uh, it was done without their permission. And so we spent uh, the better part of 10 years litigating uh, the factual question of whether, in fact, this was a private conversation, whether they had an expectation of privacy, and, and whether or not they knew or impliedly consented to the recording. Now, as it happens, uh, at, at the end of the day, um, the, the Michigan Supreme Court decided that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy here. Uh, the, the red door that you see behind you was open, hundreds of people walking back and forth, people peering in, looking in under the, all the facts taken together, they decided there was no reasonable expectation of privacy here. That's how you decide where the line is, is objectively speaking, would a normal human being expect to have a private conversation under these circumstances? The answer was no. Now, it, material fact is that it, the, all the testimony uh, suggested that this footage was being taken with big cameras slung over a guy's shoulder that they ought to have noticed. So there is also, for that reason, no objective expectation of privacy. They d denied that up and down, but the courts ultimately discounted that testimony. But still, th this, this just goes to show you how something, if you were in that setting right there, you saw those big cameras, you saw the open door, you might think to yourself, there's no way you would consider this a public or a private conversation. Uh, nevertheless, to, in order to prove that in court with evidence that a court can accept, uh, it takes testimony, it takes in-depth analysis of the video itself. We spent hours looking at reflections in mirrors and frame by frame to see if you could see a big camera. I mean, it got very detailed. And we had to go to that level uh, in order to satisfy the court system that, that no eavesdropping had occurred here. So um, there, when we're taking video, even in cir circumstances where we we don't think it could be an issue if we're, if we're really not thinking through from the perspective of a determined plaintiff uh, will miss these, um, these potential areas of exposure. And then there are other uh, specific privacy statutes that really form a crazy quilt of, of privacy law. That's, that's why privacy, even today, is such uh, a, a, a 
head scratcher. It's such a hard issue to wrap your brain around because there is no single source. And that's, again, because of this idea of free speech. That is the default setting. You have to find the areas around that, that, that area of free speech to, to protect little different areas of privacy. So here we have the Stored Communications Act, for example, that protects uh, emails that are stored on a server somewhere, electronic messages, and they're private from certain eyes under certain circumstances and, and other circumstances from other eyes, uh, from private litigants, from the government. Uh, but it, it's a fairly complicated act, but that applies only to that narrow scope. We have COPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which uh, governs uh, children's use of the internet and the gathering of information from, uh, from people under the age of 13. The Graham Leach Bliley Act, which protects financial information. We have HIPAA, which protects health care information. I mean, th there are so many, dozens, in fact, of these statutes, both on a state and on a federal level, and that's just the United States. You know, it, more and more, as we become a globalized society, we need to take into account um, the, the privacy statutes and, and considerations, legal systems of other countries, particu particularly the European Union, uh, some other, uh, other states in the, in the developed world now adopting more restrictive standards. And when our information is flying all over the world digitally, we need, we need to be cognizant of the concerns there. So how is this information being gathered, and, and how are these... Uh, these concerns, these privacy concerns being, imp being uh, affected now, being raised now, being implicated now in the sort of uh, surveillance activity that, is, that we're undertaking today. Well, who uses this information? Obviously, the government has uh, a, a large motivation to be, to be using embedded vision to surveil citizens. And for reasons why we need to look no further than last year's Boston Marathon bombing. I mean, that be really was one of the first examples of uh, embedded vision, security camera footage uh, being, being used on a massive scale, massively coordinated, to, uh, to very much con contribute to the apprehension of this suspect. If that, that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for all the uh, security camera footage uh, in the area. And so uh, we obviously have a, a strong motivation now. We, this becomes a very clear um, motivating factor, a very clear uh, excuse or reason, depending on your perspective, to uh, amplify uh, government-run surveillance in public areas. And obviously this is happening at the TSA. We've all gone through this machine, uh, some of us, to get here today. Uh, it, we're, we're giving up our privacy in that setting. Now, there's been, there's been some, some tweaks to this system. Uh, that apparently, they tell us that, that the resolution isn't quite this good anymore. Uh, but then, you know, we always find out a year later that, oh, yeah, well, remember when we told you that that wasn't actually true. We have all treasure troves of, of uh, pictures of you stored up in, in some TSA uh, um, employee's hard drive somewhere. So the, but the bottom line is, though, that we, we're, we're encountering more, more often, there's, just, there's no impediment now and, and, and every reason for government agencies to be placing uh, security cameras in just about every place that we could consider even quasi-public. Uh, latest case in point, just uh, one of the later headlines, was in Las Vegas, uh, where the, the city is now installing cameras and listening devices in the streetlights. Uh, to, to catch crime, crime and, and potential criminal activity happening in public streets. I wish they'd take the you know, people off the sidewalks handing out the, the porn flyers. Those, those really disturb me walking through the city. But in, in any event, they're, um, they're, they're looking now more closely. Uh, I, I don't need to say much about the NSA. We're all aware that they're, they're everywhere. They're probably in these devices here listening to what we're doing now. Uh, and while we don't have... Um, yet any disclosures of, of the NSA necessarily uh, infiltrating embedded vision uh, systems. We, we, we hear a lot about intercepted electronic communications uh, and, and such. It's only a matter of time till, till that gets revealed. And the more that these systems get installed everywhere, you know, the chances go up that uh, they're going to be tapping into those uh, signals. We do, in fact, in the UK, if you saw the headline just a week or so ago, know that their version of the NSA um, their government security system actually did tap into all sorts of Skype calls. And, in fact, they have this treasure trove. They have a literal trove of uh, recorded video calls, including, they say, uh, many with uh, um, uh, 
revealing uh, sexual activity, uh, private activity, private communications, things that the government has no real public interest in, but they're out there swooping all this stuff up. So it's already happened in the UK that these video transmissions have been intercepted. It's only a matter of time till we hear about it happening here. And that, that's, that's being done in more and more obvious ways. The FBI, the CIA, uh, NSA have been discussing plans, implementing plans to even put uh, balloons in the air to, to intercept uh, electronic communications. It's going to get more and more prevalent. This happens on a commercial level as well. Uh, com we have every financial motivation to surveil our customers. Jeff mentioned at the outset this morning uh, some examples of that even today. Uh, so you walk into a grocery store. It used to be there might be uh, a handful of video cameras that just looking for obvious criminal activity. Now you can't go into one without there being uh, hundreds uh, in, in every conceivable location. And Jeff mentioned uh, this morning uh, Kroger doing that just to... Uh, find the number of customers so they can allocate their, their staffing properly. But the, they're, they're looking for all sorts of things. They're looking for theft. They're looking for odd uh, behavior. They're looking for anything they can just because they can. Um, that, that will get more intimate as, as technology progresses, as wearable technology progresses. Uh, you may be familiar with Google's um, uh, recently issued patent on the pay-per-gaze advertising system where they, uh, through your wearable device, such as Google Glass, they can tell uh, what you're looking at. And not, it's, so it's not just the glass device looking out at the world, but it is actually looking back at you if you have one, uh, which I neglected to bring mine with me today. But there, there, there is an actual little sensor on the inside of it that looks back at your eye to see what your eye is looking at. And uh, it won't be long until the technology is able to look and notice what you're looking at. If it's an advertisement, then they'll be able to charge that advertiser for the time you spend looking at it. And that's billed as a much more... Uh, accurate uh, measurement of advertising costs than uh, banner ads, click-through rates, things of that nature. But it doesn't stop there. The same patent describes a pay-per-emotion system where they can tell by the dilation of your pupil um, your emotional reaction to an advertisement. So if you get excited about a commercial, that's going to cause that advertiser double than if, you just, um, if your eyes just glaze over. This is a patent that's actually been granted. Um, and we see, we see now uh, with the uh, launch of iBeacon and technologies uh, uh, that rely on Bluetooth low energy devices, uh, the passive tracking of the location of customers. Again, this, this directly itself is, does not involve vision, but these systems uh, tend to work best when they uh, collaborate with a mesh of sensors. And if not now, then certainly in the very near future, uh, vision sensing will be a part of that system. And this offers retailers the uh, opportunity to track who is coming into their, their, um, their retail location and then the ability to actually interact with that person, very much like Minority Report style. Privacy, the claims to, or concerns to this raise, obviously the, uh, the, every time we interact with one of these systems, when, when some sensor picks up the fact that it's me, or that I'm, I'm a male of a certain age, I have a certain shopping history, if they can tell who I am, um, they're, they're, they're keeping track of that data somewhere. Every interaction with that mesh, every, every touch of that, that invisible network leaves a trace somewhere. Like I, I draw the analogy like walking in snow. Uh, your, your footprints you leave behind, and the longer you walk through that snow, uh, the, the more tracks you're going to leave. So it it will not be long until it's very much possible to digitally track where you physically walked, almost as if you um, have walked in snow, just by the electronic traces that you leave behind, that your devices leave in interacting with the, the mesh networks that you walk through or walk past. Uh, this, this is the idea of the Internet of Things, which we're all familiar with. Um, but w what you might not have caught is that last fall, the Federal Trade Commission announced its, its first uh, enforcement action against someone uh, offering Internet of Things technology. This is the company TrendNet, which does home video surveillance. This is embedded vision. And uh, they offer in-home monitoring and, and such. But what, it, what they didn't do, according to the FTC, was securely... Um, protect the integrity of that data. In other words, the, the embedded vision uh, footage was being transmitted to users over the internet, but in an unencrypted, a very easily hackable uh, manner, uh, such that the uh, data was not secure and was in fact intercepted. So hackers were tapping into these networks in order to look and see what was going on in people's homes. 
Anyone here have a door bot on, on their front door? Know what I'm talking about? I actually have one. It's very cool. It's, uh, it's a, a, a recent Kickstarter funded device that it basically installs a little video camera in your uh, doorbell so that when the, when the button is, is rung, it goes to your phone. You can, you can accept the call on your, on your smartphone and interact with the person at your front door by video uh, no matter where you are in the world. Again, same concept, using uh, the video-enabled Internet of Things device to uh, increase our ability to, to interact with folks, but all that data being transmitted over the Internet, uh, we need to make sure that it's kept secure in order to make sure that our privacy interests are protected. So, and then we get to the concept of surveillance. Is anyone familiar with this term? Coined by a, name, uh, a, a guy uh, named Steve Mann, who you'll see in a minute. But he uh, it, it is basically a play on the term surveillance. Sur being a French word mean, a meaning from up above. So surveillance being uh, big brother basically watching you from up above. Su uh, being the prefix that means, means we uh, on the person level. So surveillance is basically us surveilling each other, surveilling ourselves, our own lives, recording our own lives. And this is a technology we all know that is taking off. Uh, we've all had uh, the ability to do that in our pockets for quite some time. Uh, the smartphones that are coming out now, uh, most of them have video cameras that we can wear around and record uh, whatever we want, whenever we want. Now, in light of that, the fact that, that there's all this uproar now over Google Glass seems a little bit misplaced. You know, Jeff referenced the, the recent incident where a woman was, was uh, uh, roughed up in a bar because she wore these. Um, not the first incident of people getting violent reactions to uh, someone wearing Google Glass. Um, the, with with the, the visceral sense being that, oh, well, there's somebody pointing a video camera in my face, I feel violated. Uh, when's the last time we heard of anybody getting kicked out of a bar because they were playing with their smartphone? Uh, and yet the, um, the, the smartphone has so much more capacity to, to record uh, surreptitiously than a Google camera does. If I'm wearing Google Glass on my face in order to record you, uh, not only do I have to say in a loud bar, hey, okay, Glass, take a video, Right? or press a button that's very, very uh, obvious, but then the light comes on, so you see the little light there, and I have to be looking at you. It's not a mobile camera. I have to move it with my head. So if I want to record you in a video in a bar, I have to be staring at you. If I want to be record recording you with my phone, I can do that anywhere I want. I can leave it on the table. I can carry it like this. I can do something that looks uh, very, um, very non-conspicuous, uh, but is in fact recording a lot more than that Google Glass ever could. So here, we, again, we just see uh, privacy as a visceral reaction. You know, we feel, we get very upset about these ideas of privacy, even though we don't really know why. We, we can't really necessarily explain exactly where this idea of privacy comes from or what aspect of privacy it is that we think we're losing all of a sudden. This wearable technology uh, very much picking up speed, only going to continue this trend of surveillance farther. This is one uh, example called Capture with a K, uh, another Kickstarter-funded device that is an always-on audio recorder. It's, a, it's basically a watch that is, is on 24-7 recording audio, records over itself every minute or so. So if something interesting happens or somebody says something funny that you want to capture, you click the button, and so you've saved the past 30 seconds or the past 60 60 seconds or whatever it is, and, and you, you've got that. But you've, you're always recording just in case, just so you don't miss anything. Uh, there's a very similar device uh, from a video perspective called the look -see which is basically just a little Bluetooth device. And again, I have one of these because you know, I blog about the stuff, so I have to have it firsthand. And um, uh, it, it, it looks very much like, and in fact is, a Bluetooth um, headset. You can talk to, uh, to your phone through this device. But it also has a video camera right in the front. So it's also recording, and it's, it's always on. You just leave it on, and, and, and it is also looking in front of you and recording everything you see, and tapes over itself every five hours. And if you want, to, if something happens that you want to keep, you hit the button, it records the last 30 seconds. It saves that as a clip. And that one even ties into your phone by Bluetooth so that you can be looking at the, the video feed on your phone. You can even broadcast it online directly to Facebook if you want. Uh, so that's the sort of surveillance, the, 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 the ground level video embedded technology that uh, people are, are using now. 
I mentioned Steve Mann. He is a professor now at the University of Toronto. He was at MIT for a long time. And you, you may have seen some articles. He actually uh, received the same violent reaction when he wore his personal headset uh, at a McDonald's in France. He had somebody come up and try to rip it off his face. Uh, but he's been doing this for 30-odd years now. He is the original Google Glass guy, um, perfecting this technology on his own. Very much believes in the idea of surveillance. In fact, um, he spoke at last year's Augmented World Expo, and he and I have, have had a dialogue about um, exploring this, uh, for, this idea from a legal perspective and exploring whether, indeed, with all of this technology at our fingertips, maybe it's time to articulate a legal right to, uh, to conduct surveillance. There's already uh, a First Amendment right to tell your own story. So if you tell your, your, your autobiography and it happens to include salacious details about other people, that's most often not going to be considered by a court an invasion of that person's privacy because you're not talking about them, you're talking about your own story. You have a right to say what you experienced. That would be taking this idea uh, to the, the video surveillance level and would be a right to record what happens to you in your own first-person perspective. Maybe sounds a little intimidating, sounds a little uh, uh, viscerally invasive, but it's, it's the logical conclusion of the ideas that we've been talking about and how the law is going to shape up on this uh, idea is yet to be seen. So... With this, uh, we have the particular application of facial recognition technology. And uh, I've, I've been participating in a process um, fo hosted by the National Institutes of Technology or you know, Tech Telecommunications Administration, uh, some, some abbreviation, some acronym in, in D.C., uh, Department of Commerce uh, sub-agency, that has been uh, hosting a, um, a roundtable discussion from industry members on uh, industry standards for facial recognition privacy and trying to come up with an enforceable set of standards that the uh, industry can agree to without there having to be law passed. And through that process, I've learned a lot about facial uh, recognition technology, including this here, which is uh, the breakdown of how any biometric system, including facial recognition, works. Turns out there's actually five distinct subsystems uh, to a, a, a system like this. We have the data collection, whoops, wrong button, data collection subsystem which actually records you. This is the embedded vision right here. It takes that to the signal data, uh, signal processing system where it breaks it down into something that can be analyzed. And from here, it can go in a couple different directions. We, we have facial detection technology, which all, does what exactly it sounds like. It, it determines if there's a face there, uh, although it doesn't tell you who that face belongs to. Uh, that it, you can compare to uh, other other data that you, that you have here in, the, in a data storage system. You, you send it here to this comparison subsystem where you're comparing the input to the data that you have previously stored. And then it goes here to a decision subsystem where ultimately you get uh, the results spit back out you, at you that you're looking for. If it's identification, then all you're doing is you're processing the signal enough to tell you whatever it is that you want. Is there a face there? Yes. Are there two eyeballs and a nose? Yes. Is, is this face, does this face belong to a male or a female? Are they of a certain age, um, those sorts of things. Anything that doesn't actually personally identify you, that's a facial detection system. A facial recognition system, on the other hand, goes one step further. It compares to a different data storage base, which contains uh, actual personally identifiable information there and compares it to the signal that you have. And then your decision subsystem then is, is set up to ask you, is there a match there? Uh, can you verify that this is the person, uh, that this person whose data you're collecting uh, belongs to this data right here that's already stored in my data sub storage subsystem? How is this being implemented right now? Well, on the commercial side of things, uh, we have examples of both. Uh, Tesco, which is one of the largest retailers in the UK, uh, just rolled out a facial detection system where they are looking to see, uh, is this customer male or female? Are they be between a certain age range? Uh, and based on that information, offers this customer uh, certain discounts, uh, certain promotions, whatever else. In the employment context, we see a lot 
of increase in the use of biometrics, including facial recognition, to verify the, uh, employee identity. So we might uh, today uh, get through an office wearing an identification card or uh, something that has an RFID tag in it that we have to swipe next to a scanner. Um, the next level of security above that is biometrics, where uh, we're actually uh, looking into a scanner, whether that's an iris scanner or a full facial scanner, to identify um, who that employee is. And we see that also on, on the retail end of things. Virgin uh, is, is experimenting with their, their uh, Sky Club uh, attendants actually wearing a Google Glass headset um, that is intended to recognize high value customers so that the person knows, hey, this is a high value customer, knows who that customer is, and has their preferences basically stored right there in their headset so that they can offer uh, personalized services on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We see it implemented in, in law enforcement. The Seattle police have, have announced that they've rolled out this facial recognition system uh, through their street cameras to try to pick up uh, people on the street that they're looking for. Um, they, again, promised that that wouldn't be stored for any length of time, would only be used for certain purposes, and then Snowden came out and realized uh, they were uh, sharing that a bit more widely than they had originally let on. Uh, the New York uh, airport, same thing. We, I talked about uh, uh, cameras in the lamppost in Vegas. Now we have cameras in the Newark airport that have facial recognition capability. And then this other uh, example here, this excerpt is from a manual uh, published by the FBI describing its efforts to use facial recognition technology. So as, as much reticence, as much... Um, hesitation as we see in the commercial sphere to roll out facial recognition technology, like Facebook, for example, um, has all this facial data that they, they're sitting on Google the same way. They, just, they don't want to be the first ones to, to roll this out and get the backlash. Uh, government, no such concern. They're, they're, they're implementing it uh, for law enforcement purposes. But we do have a, a, a demand on the consumer level for facial recognition, even if it's just to sort our photos. right? We, with all these devices taking all these photos in our pocket, we have a hard time sorting through them all to find pictures of a certain person. That's where technology like this can come in very handy. That's why when, when Facebook pictures pop up and ask us to tag them, uh, it, they want to be able to determine, uh, are these all the photos of this particular person so I can make them appear on other pages as well. So let's, let's walk through how some of this might actually look uh, on an interactive person-to-person -person level, especially if... if we're applying this to uh, wearable technology such as, as headsets like this. So this is, this is the most obvious application of, of facial recognition in a one-on-one -on -one wearable situation where you could, you could uh, look at someone and automatically recognize who they are, get their social media uh, information such as you know, basic LinkedIn professional data. I personally would love to have this. This is why uh, I can't wait for more apps uh, using facial recognition to launch on platforms like Glass and other headsets like that because this would actually help me a lot at parties because I'm terrible at remembering names. Uh, and it, it, work, it works best if you tie it in not only to th services like LinkedIn that share intentional amounts of data, uh, but, but also your, your own personal notes about this person. Uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was the NSA saying, yeah, you're right, we're listening. Um, apparently, they, okay, they really don't like me because they disabled my little clicker. Let's do it this way. Maybe they just don't want me walking around so much. So... Imagine that you could add your own notes about the person. So you could, you could customize it. Here, and this would work on a facial recognition level that's just one-to-one. -one. You wouldn't necessarily need to store it on a commercial database. If only your headset, your personal device, recognizes the face, it's enough to give you this information that you know about this person, the stuff that you personally want to remember. But when we talk about... Uh, when we connect then the, that facial recognition to a, a broader, more commercially available database, is the, the potentials uh, mushroom. So we know that, that social media is not just about happy information or information that we want to share. It's about information that you know, people uh, don't uh, necessarily want shared about themselves, but other third parties are sharing about them. Maybe uh, it links you to, to different groups that you wouldn't want to necessarily be associated with or that other people can use to, to, to tear you down. 
and we get into, we tie, tie in that data together, uh, your facial recognition. I talked about the passive collection of, of data. Here we're talking about geolocation data. So again, the, the, the snow prints, the, the footprints in the snow. If you can look at someone and know where they've been, now we're talking about tying two different uh, forms of data together. Uh, you can keep an eye on where they've been. And here in this example, uh, you know, you, you, I've highlighted an area where if, if my wife is watching me, she might be particularly concerned that I've showed up in certain places. And maybe, maybe somebody has, has alerts set up so when I enter a certain place, they'd know. We already have that on our phones. I, mean, I already look up my family and find my friends on my iPhone. I could tell geographically where they are. This is just taking the same data that already exists and tying it together in a way that's more useful and more invasive at the same time. Now we start talking about tying that into uh, uh, retail and commercial systems. So suppose uh, not just friends, not just social acquaintances, family, but uh, credit card companies or mortgage companies uh, associate this, this data. They, they, I walk into their office for a loan or I, I, I meet with a retailer. They can look at me and then automatically tie in uh, information such as credit scores. So I've literally got this hanging over my head now. Uh, has anyone here read uh, the books Demon and Freedom by the uh, author Daniel Suarez? Okay, at least a couple. If you haven't, go out and do that immediately. They're excellent books that, that, that really convey these, these concepts in a very visceral way. And there's a scene uh, in which the two characters are wearing these augmented reality headsets, and they're watching people walk by in a, in a public mall. And they, you, you see literally this, credit scores, total net values hanging over people's heads, uh, just illustrating the idea of this data enhancement. This, that's, that's a term coined by the uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, where you're taking two bits of data that by themselves are not private private, but when combined, uh, offer uh, in, in invasion, or at least a feeling of invasion, that's a lot more tangible than either of these would. So seeing my face in public, not an invasion. Seeing um, my credit score on a website somewhere, not an invasion. I know that's out there. Putting the two together, now all of a sudden I feel invaded. You know, that's kind of the, the same phenomenon we see with Google Glass. I, I, I see people wearing glasses all the time. I know people carry around camera phones. But for some reason, uh, putting that camera phone, in, that, that video system, in a place that I can see and that is pointed at me feels more obnoxious to some people. That's the, there's nothing new. It's just combining it in different ways. And then there's accuracy issues. So, so... Some accuracy issues maybe we wouldn't mind so much, you know, uh, but others we would. What happens when we tie it into databases like that? I mean, we've already got geo maps, Google Maps online. You can go to, go to any city website, and you can find exact addresses of where the sex offenders in your neighborhood live. This is just one step further. This is data enhancement, making it more uh, accessible to the consumer, but then again, a lot more invasive to the person being targeted. How can, how can this identification go wrong? Well, we, we've seen it now. Fa facial recognition, for all its potential, is still a work in progress. It, it, it makes mistakes uh, for, for reasons so, as simple as things that look like a face but aren't, uh, but even, even how people change over time. Another interesting fact that came out of this process, this NTIA process I've participated in in D.C., is just how fallible facial recognition uh, information is over time. So people age, their face changes. Turns out that uh, a facial scan is only reliable for about 8 to 10 years, and then your face changes uh, so much that it's not reliable anymore. Um, there's special, special cases such as people who change genders you know, who, or get um, uh, other sorts of plastic surgery and intentionally change the appearance of their faces. It doesn't even have to go that far. Just the, the setting in which you take the picture, I mean, the, the, the recognition technology is that fragile uh, so that if, you're, if you've positioned yourself differently, turned your head slightly to the left or the right, you've got uh, different lighting situations, all of these things can throw off the accuracy of your scan. So how, how does that tie into privacy issues? Well, we, we've seen. Once we rely on this recognition technology, this, these scans, to give us information, we have a need to make sure that that information is correct. And so if by turning my head slightly or a shadow being cast on my face causes the machine to think I'm somebody else who turns out to be a sex offender. That has real consequences for me. So I have a real interest in this technology being accurate. 
before it gets implemented on a wide scale. Beyond that, though, I think what, what hits home for people the most, and what at least seems or feels the most invasive to people about facial recogni recognition technology is their loss of anonymity. Um, the reason why different police departments uh, implement this stuff on a broad scale on a public street um, is not to find information that they couldn't, couldn't get otherwise. We, we can't hide our face in a public place. We don't hide our faces. Um, but we feel like we've, we, we're no longer a face in the crowd. We, we lose our sense of anonymity in large places. And that's what this technology is meant to overcome. It's meant to eliminate anonymity in large places for uh, situations exactly like the Boston Marathon bomber. We want to have the ability to sift through uh, hundreds and thousands of faces in a large public place and pick out the one, identify the one that we're looking for. Now that's great in a law enforcement setting like that when we catch a bad guy. It doesn't feel so great when we're the ones potentially being picked out of the crowd. Question though, where does that right to anonymity come from? It's nowhere in, in, in the sources of law that I've identified, and frankly, it doesn't precisely exist right now. We have that feeling like we ought to, but that we can't point to a sense, a source of law that gives us that right to be anonymous in a crowd. How does this play out legally? Well, um, we, we see common law decisions continue to be rendered. So it, it, while we might not yet have a right to anonymity, uh, perhaps there will be a judge that decides on a common law basis that this is some form of invasion of privacy. Again, common law being this, this moldable, constantly uh, shifting idea of what we generally as a society consider to be private as decided by a single judge. So there could very well be a judge who decides, hey, this goes too far. Uh, just a couple of years ago here in California, there was a judge that said, well, your, your family has a right, a privacy right in your autopsy photos. Well, that's not a right that ever existed before. But now, uh, in all the circumstances of that particular case, the judge decided, yeah, you know, I think that the deceased's family has this privacy right. Well, that's only because uh, that judge thought so. If other judges pick up on that, then we have that new right. But until those court decisions happen, we don't really know uh, what the boundaries of those rights are going to be. Uh, I mentioned uh, the Federal Trade Commission. They've, they've been looking at this from a regulatory perspective, gathering information and, um, and, and input and, and putting out there what they think the, the best rules of the road would be. And they, they've proposed some standards for protecting privacy in the facial recognition field. Uh, a lot of pushback from the industry saying, hey, this is still too, too brand new of technology. Don't start to regulate us just yet. Let's, let us figure it out for themselves. Uh, but then there's, then there's individuals who never fail to come up with creative um, causes of action in the court system. And this I'm only going to touch on briefly for matters of time, uh, but this is something that uh, I, I could go into a whole separate speech about, uh, and that's the right of publicity. This is an offshoot of the right of publicity, the common law right of publicity. And in many jurisdictions, it is still a common law right. In some jurisdictions, it's um, a statutory right now. But uh, the, the, the image here is meant to represent a guy named Zakini, who is a circus performer who shot himself out of a cannon. That was his act. That was his gig. That was his sole claim to fame. And a, a local TV news crew filmed the entire act and then broadcast it on the news. He sued and eventually won in the United States Supreme Court, the only right of publicity case that the Supreme Court has decided, uh, which said the First Amendment does not go so far as to uh, allow a news crew to uh, completely usurp the thing that makes you famous or the thing that gives your identity commercial value. It decided on that particular case that the First Amendment, that realm of free speech, did not go that far. So there is a realm out there that, uh, that citizens can protect uh, the commercial use of their identities. So how does that tie into embedded vision, facial recognition technology? Well, eventually, uh, the, uh, the plaintiff lawyers out there are going to realize that these uh, faces that are being gathered on a mass level each have commercial value. If, if retailers are collecting your face, they're storing it because they want to give you uh, commercial discounts, whatever else, uh, they're doing it for commercial uh, motivations. They're doing it for commercial reasons. And it, it, all it takes is a creative lawyer and a, a green judge to, to render a decision that that's, that's a, a usurpation, uh, a, a use of that person's right of publicity, the right to control the commercial exploitation of their likeness. And then we've got a system, a legal system, in which we have to pay for each scan of a face. 
So what do we do about this? A uh, few different approaches. Uh, the easiest, of course, is to get consent. We're, we're, here we're talking about rights, and privacy rights are just that something, a, a, a right that one has to control. That right can be uh, waived, it can be uh, given away, it can be transacted away. That's what happens when we give consent. And that can happen in an implied sense. When there's uh, an obvious sign that says you're being filmed, you continue to be there anyway, and uh, you consent to being filmed. Or you actually fill out a waiver, uh, you fill out a form, or you agree to terms, like we see terms of use on a website. Uh, we're, we're agreeing and writing uh, to give away our right of publicity or right of privacy, rather. We can self-regulate. We've seen that happen on the individual retail level, where, uh, again, people have this visceral sense that they're being invaded, so they ban certain types of technology from their premises. We have that on the developer side or the, the manufacturer side. So Google, uh, ha, as I mentioned, is sitting on their facial recognition capability. They specifically tell the developers of, of applications for Google Glass, we, we do not allow you to use our software for facial recognition purposes. Also, I pointed out the fact that the little light stays on. Uh, that's by design, as shown here in these terms. They actually require applications to keep that light on for the purpose of letting people know that a video is being taken. Here, our host, Qualcomm, uh, publishes the, the Vuforia augmented reality uh, program. And you'll see here, uh, deep within these terms of conditions, you see facial recognition, one of the prohibited uses for that software. Nobody wants to be the first one to take all the heat for gathering uh, facial recognition. And, and given the, the visceralness of the reaction, that's, that's a valid choice. Uh, th then we start to think creatively. There's uh, this guy online here um, who, who proposed the idea of a robots.txt for your face. Uh, you, you, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the, with the robots.txt file. It's the file you can put on a, a, an HTML page that prevents a search engine from crawling that particular uh, web page. So the idea being that facial recognition uh, camera software ought to be programmed with the same ability to recognize something uh, on the person's face that says, hey, don't crawl me. Don't, don't catalog my face. All it, all it would take is, is industry adoption of a standard like that, and it would become the de facto norm. There's encryption possibilities. There are all sorts of discussion from professionals already in this field, already using this technology, for using the parameters of your face to uh, encrypt the, the uh, recognition data that comes out of it, and then, and, and then uh, requiring a key that only that person would have. And then finally, uh, coming together to, to stake out new norms, and this is this NTIA process that, uh, that I referred to, the uh, National Tele Telecommunications and Information Administration is what it breaks down to. But this is a picture from the last meeting that we had in D.C. Uh, of all of us from, from consumer watchdogs to uh, banner ad uh, companies to uh, hardware producers all coming around a round table, uh, a literal round table, uh, to discuss what our standards ought to be and to see if we can come up with something that we can all agree to uh, as an industry. That's my presentation for you. Um, I just, uh, just filled the time that I have, but I don't know if they'll allow for questions if we have any. Yeah, but thank you Feel very free much, to find Brad. me afterwards if you have any. Thank you very much. Awesome presentation. And uh, I think we have time for, for a few quick questions, and then there'll be uh, more, more time during the break uh, if there are more questions for Brian. Any, any questions right now? I have one for you, Brian, which mm -hmm. is um, you talked mostly about the U.S. What, what, which countries have the most sophisticated law regulation regarding these matters today? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I'd, I'd use the word sophisticated, but certainly the most um, complex and onerous are those in the EU, uh, particularly Germany has, has um, some strict laws where even, even some of the states within Germany have their own privacy laws for activity that happens in those states. So we, the, there's uh, a need to pay attention to the, the federal and the state level in Germany, just like you know, we have California that always wants to pass its own law governing the Internet. Um, we have that in other countries as well. Australia just passed new privacy reforms, so it's, it's a, a complex and changing circumstance across the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering, were uh, your legal fees in the um, RAP case uh, the cause of the Detroit bankruptcy over those 10 years? <laughs> or, uh, um, 
there was a case in, uh, not a case, but a situation in 2011 with actually an app that I created, and it, it didn't use computer vision, although that was one of the plans for it. I, I've got no financial interest, and I sold the company a long time ago, but four U.S. senators uh, got my app, um, a feature of my app, the most important feature, removed from the App Store, and that was the ability for 10 million users, which was the base at the time, to share where DUI checkpoints are. Do you remember share that? Share what? I'm sorry? Where do you, sobriety checkpoints. Okay. So yeah, it was yeah. an app where people could share, and yeah. it was actually extremely effective. And it caused uh, a U.S. Senator Schumer uh, to hold a press conference uh, in New York on Fifth Avenue in front of the Apple store about getting my app removed, which ultimately did happen. It was after I sold the company. But um, it was, uh, I just wanted to know if you, I guess so you have not heard of that case? It does ring a bell. I didn't, didn't okay. catch what you said. I just wanted your opinion on it because, I mean, clearly the um, police setting up a DUI checkpoint do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and, uh, you know, ironically, one of the things I wanted to do with that app was to have the camera on the phone automatically recognize police uh, speed trap enforcement, DUI checkpoints, and things like that so people didn't have to uh, manually put them in. But... Um, I mean, I, I guess I, it just, you know, it, it made me think, you know, where is this all going? Is, you know, the, ultimately it never went to court, but the company who bought my company sort of put its tail between its legs and, and removed the feature just because of the potential bad PR. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's just it. You know, it was easier for them to fight you on the PR level than it was to actually try and, and pass a law or bring some sort of lawsuit. Because there have been a number of lawsuits on filming police. And universally, the police have lost those cases. Uh, and that's actually what we tried to make that the, the concert case about, what our primary argument was, was that not to argue to get into the nitty gritty of the facts of was there a big camera, was the door open, but who was it that was being filmed? There are police officers, uh, public servants acting in the line of duty, and the public has an inherent interest in monitoring what they're doing and holding them accountable for their actions. And here, in fact, the next day when we went to court after this, this confrontation to get an injunction against them doing it again, the court found that they had uh, violated the concert's uh, First Amendment rights. Uh, so, I mean, here we've caught them doing something unconstitutional. How can they possibly have a privacy interest in that? But even, even when uh, the cops are, are performing within the, the, the constitutional boundaries, courts across the country have held that these are public servants. The subject matter of what's being filmed is inherently public. Um, so I, I would have a strong opinion, um, generally speaking, that um, displaying information of what police are doing in public uh, in, in plain view, there's nothing covert about it, uh, is, is public information. Uh, similar case, in fact, with uh, drivers flashing their lights to each other to, to warn of, of traffic stops. Uh, the court upheld that to be free speech protected activity. Yeah. Hi, I, uh, this is kind of computer vision related, but I remember Google Street was uh, filming, uh, you know, their, their, their street pictures. And uh, Barbara Streisand tried to take Google to court because it shared uh, a view of her home, and she lost that. And I, I wonder if the Google Glass becomes one of these kinds of things, where the expectation of privacy if you, is, is gone, uh, and even somebody with a lot of clout couldn't really fight that very well. Yeah, in the United States, you'd be hard-pressed to, to take something like that down. A house, quintessentially in the public view, there's nothing private about it. Europeans have a different view on that in a lot of circumstances. Um, but, yeah, no, you're not going to get that removed. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about the indoors of somebody's house, you're always talking about the potential for an invasion of privacy. Yeah, that's the classic place that we consider to be private. Now, we, we, you, you used in your question the example of Google Glass. I mean, I've explained why I think that's a straw man, why, why glass is a whole lot less invasive than a lot of other technologies. But uh, point taken, if you, if you take recording technology into someone else's house, you, you ought to get their permission.
a uh, question if you didn't hear is what, what, what about in the schools? Can children record how they're being treated by teachers to, to keep them accountable? Interesting question. Uh, that, that comes a little bit closer to the line because there, there are more considerations involved. There's kids being recorded along with the teachers. Um, and, and although there's no express prohibition on filming children in public places, um, there, there's still a bit more of a sensitivity uh, when it comes to kids. Um, so there's, there's that issue. There's also the disruption to the learning environment. So I do um, a lot of law related to social media as well. And there are a lot of cases on filming uh, surreptitiously in the classroom, posting that up to YouTube or whatever else, um, and, and kids, students being disciplined for that because it disrupts the learning environment, either while they're taking the video or the effect of posting the video then disrupts the learning environment. And that's something that schools have the right to regulate. So it's a more complex situation. But the idea of holding teachers in a public school who are public servants accountable um, is, is, is a valid argument. Uh, one, one last question, then we'll take a break. So a lot of this stuff like a lot of complex things for consumers, they have no idea what's happening. Um, we did a study where we were looking at whether or not people had any knowledge of uh, that Samsung Galaxy phones were actually monitoring them over video in order to do the eye gaze tracking stuff that they're doing. No comment at all, because users don't even realize what's happening to kind of enable these gestures and gadgets and things of that sort. How do you solve the education problem, right? We can only be outraged if we know that we need to be outraged. Yeah. And if not, then we deserve to be bored like frogs. <laughs> and the, the other problem is, even when we know, do we care? Uh, and, and that's uh, something I was discussing earlier with somebody else here. Then that's ultimately a generational issue. Uh, if we, we don't have any tangible example, tangible experience with our data being used against us, it's hard to get upset about it. Um, maybe so, you know, even, even Snowden's revelations haven't gotten people as motivated as, as many might have thought. So uh, until we see that, that really being misused, um, I, I don't think we're going to get much outrage, education or not. If you have more questions for Brian, he'll be around the rest of the day. Uh, please join me again in thanking Brian for the really interesting presentation. <laughs>